Kevin Harris is really an incredible artist to be sharing a journey with. He is both an extremely talented composer and musician who works alone in his head, in his heart, creating music, but then has the talent and ability to uh, be an educator and you really feel when he's around you that he is kind of taking in and truly listening which also makes sense as a musician. Um, he's listening really deeply and attentively, and then he processes what he hears from folks and puts it back out in a way that enables people in his community to feel heard and seen and encouraged, um, which is an incredible mix to have someone who's both um, so good with people and kind of bringing people along, and then his own deep talent and technical prowess as a musician. My name is Kevin Harris. I'm a jazz pianist. I'm an educator. I'm also a composer. And I like to say I'm a practitioner of curiosity, but, and uh, so a combination of those. Yeah. I just feel like, you know, for, especially as artists, we are constantly interpreting the information that we get in front of us. You know, we walk into a room and there's always possibilities there, but if we walk into them and we're not even looking with an eye of curiosity, then we just kind of accept it for what it is, you know. Uh, and as a, as a pianist, you know, I can play those 88 keys right there, or I can like, create some percussion on the sides, I can keep on playing on keys that aren't there, I can include the audience. How much of that is my instrument? Is the audience also my instrument? What goes beyond that? So, um, there's, um, there's this quote, I'm gonna mess it up. <laughs> it's Frederick Douglass. He talks about how we're all picture makers and reformers. And it's our kind of duty to look at things and by the reflection of what things are supposed to be and really are, they see what they could be through us as artists. So that's what I kind of mean by that curiosity of just what else could this be? So the piece is called Doorways. The process for me, it started and was inspired by the arches over the balcony. From that room, I was, I was hanging out just with my wife. We were at the Isabella just kind of walking through, hanging out. And it's very inspired also by her because she was walking through and just kind of making note of how she felt going room to room, like from doorway, through doorway to doorway. So I'm like, isn't that, you know, like a, a pretty profound inspiration. The Caduaro balconies are the centerpiece of the most public space in the museum that we're most famous for in a lot of ways. They are the kind of features in the walls that when people step into the courtyard for the first time, they see. Mm. They're, and they're literally taken off of a facade, right? In a, in a Venetian palazzo, kind of turned inside out and installed to create, what is it once a very public space, but also one that's closed off to the outside view. One of my favorite things about the Gardner Museum that people don't always realize is everything is part of the collection, pretty much that you see when you step in. So you might think, oh, it's just the Titian painting. It's just the John Singer Sargent. That's not true. We also catalog things like each of those balconies because Isabella intended them to be part of the collection. They're historic objects. They're installed to be experienced. And I think it really speaks to how important it was for her to share not only pieces from around the world, but this 
but architecture is art that you can inhabit. And she wanted to create these spaces that you could actually inhabit, take history that you could inhabit and put it in her museum. Like, okay, so if we're, if we're in a space in, in, the, in the museum, when you're walking through from room to room, you notice some people are like flying through and they're like, okay, I'm checking out that, I like that, I like this, I like that. And then other people would just sit for like 10, 15 minutes just to observe one, <laughs> one item. Or maybe just, you know, the, the, the character of the room. And, and obviously at the Gardener, each room has a very specific character that there's a lot you can just kind of take in. And so from that, I'm thinking, how much is there to learn just as human beings when we do sit still as opposed to always on the go? How much can we really, do we really miss? The idea of doorways going from space to space and from a, like a project idea is minute to minute or month to month or generation to generation. Those things we can learn or maybe just absolutely miss as a result of not valuing what time and space has to offer us from doorway to doorway. So I'm just thinking about specifically, you know, those people who sit and the ones who don't and what's to be valued and learned from both situations. Sometimes we don't have a choice. Sometimes we can't sit, but how best can we take it in as we're going along? So yeah, doorways, I guess besides doorways, it's like all the space in between the doorways too and what we have to experience in between them. Just musically speaking, I wanted to create a piece that didn't sound like just one song that, again, just sits in one space, you know, but instead let that, the character, one part of the song have a character that clearly transitions to another part. That somebody would maybe say, oh man, that's, that's like a totally different song, you know, that represents a totally different image in one's head or something. Some, I, some composers call it uh, through composition to where you don't really stop, but the, the idea of different movements, if you will, are captured under one umbrella thought or conception. It's kind of through composed, but most through composed pieces are much longer. This is a shorter piece but with different, um, different colors, if you will. I think having to do that, having to just start from a new curious place and go somewhere new, having to do that every time for the new room, going through that new doorway, I had to start that process again. But just like, you know how when you walk through one room, you haven't completely forgotten where you come from. Metaphorically speaking, or whether you're just walking from one room to another. You haven't, somehow your new experience is being influenced by the one you just experienced. That's who we are as people. From a young age, I'm born and raised in, in Lexington, Kentucky. So growing up, both my mother and my father were musically, they loved music. Neither one of them were professional musicians. There's not a day I can remember where my mother was not singing around the house and harmonizing with herself. So maybe she wasn't singing the melody, but she was harmonizing with the melody that should be. So she, very, from a very young age, we learned how to create counter harmonies, not from her at the piano, but just hearing her sing. Everything was on a record player, Motown. She liked also bluegrass music, country and Western music. Like we were just taught very young not to be biased toward music. Um, Black gospel was probably the, work, the, the most of what we heard because uh, we had that experience growing up. My father loved Nina Simone, so that was around too. But yeah, that was my younger experience. Let me think around age, maybe 13, 14. Unfortunately, I lost my father around that time. But that was also the same time I started playing more piano. I played the trumpet first. And I had a, my band director, his name was Charles Little. And uh, he's probably one of the most, the biggest musical influences on my life because he's a piano player and he was teaching me. You know, a majority of the kids, you know, black and brown kids from uh, kind of inner city, you know, scenarios. So it's not like 
we're just coming to play music. For a lot of folks, this is like home. Uh, then undergraduate school, I decided to get my education degree and I had a really great piano teacher there. His name was Jay Flippin. He would ask me questions like this. He would sit there, it was two pianos, right? And he would be sitting there and he would say, all right, I'm gonna play a song for you. I was like, great. And he would play some Bach. And I'm like, okay, that's classical. He's like, you know, we need to learn this, great, great. And then he would play some Charlie Parker which is jazz music, you know, bebop category. And he would put JS Bach melodies with bebop harmonies. And he'd go, now what is it? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, is it jazz? Is it classical music? And of course I didn't have an answer for it. And he goes, that's the point. It's your job to create great music. Again, we're back at curiosity again. You know, but I need you to be curious with this because people are gonna try to put you in boxes. Sometimes it's good, you know, we need principles to stand on and to springboard from. So you should figure out the rules and the way that art works. But it's your job to challenge it and you know, cause your students and other people in life to ask these questions. The Worthington Street Lobby. What's interesting about that to me is it's, um, it was a private space during her lifetime. So as people may or may not know, at the end of her life, she lived in apartments on the fourth floor of the, of the museum. And she had an entrance for herself to be able to kind of not enter through the public entrance, go straight to an elevator and go upstairs to go home. And I doubt she sort of knew she was doing this, but it comes out, it works out nicely. Um, a lot of the decoration in there is actually Chinese and Japanese. I know the most about the Chinese works. Um, they're wooden, they're wooden works um, with some lacquer from the 19th century, probably. And some of them are doorways. So they would have been, again, architectural salvage. They would have been salvaged from merchants homes or um, during the Qing dynasty in China and sold by dealers who knew there was a growing interest in Chinese art and architecture in the United States. But one of the pieces, and I will give a shout out to Nancy Berliner, our consulting curator of Chinese art, it turns out is not actually kind of public architectural salvage that Isabella then hung on the wall, but is a bed. It's a Chinese box bed that was um, then disassembled and is hung so that like fantastic archway that Isabella was walking through every time she went upstairs to her own space was actually the feature point of a 19th century Chinese bed. Really? And so there's something uh. so intimate about that and that that ends up in her private entrance to her way home. For Isabella, in her time, she was certainly coming up against a lot of naysayers. She probably had a lot of people already doubting her because she was a woman, period. The minute she starts to endeavor into such a massive project as this, every step along the way, there was probably somebody saying, that's not going to happen. No, you're not going to be able to do this. And then on top of all of that, because she was a woman, that was augmented even more. It, it is a form of inspiration. You know, here we are again from doorway to doorway. I'm sure when she said, you know, this is the way I want this room to be. I'm sure she had somebody trying to explain to her because she was a woman, she didn't understand this or that. Clearly, she looked right through them and said, oh, thank you for that opinion and just probably moved on, you know. One has to develop a habit of doing that. As I can only imagine what Isabella was going through and what she did to inspire others, even us today, I think about one of my heroes, who is Maya Angelou. Maya Angelou said of many great things, you've already been paid for, meaning the generation the doorway before you has already paid for you to be where you are doing what you're doing. So I feel a responsibility to do the same for others. But in the sense that I've already been
paid for means is there's this kind of like profound understanding that I need to internalize that. I need to really take the time to understand what that means. It's like, yeah, 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 okay, you know, all right, thank you, Mom. You know, that's not that's just more than a phone call, you know, to my mom and and all you know, all the generations that came before her. That you know, like every step, every opportunity to say something, to play something, to communicate to others has already been paid for by someone who came before me. That's profound, you know. In regards to the museum, there's an extra component for me as a black male because I'm walking through the Isabella and I'm seeing lots of artwork that does not reflect me as a black male. And so I have to lean on Maya's words even more in a place like that where there's a potential to be, for lack of a better word, a bit lonely. Uh, I must lean on those words even more. I hope that a majority of the listeners, if not all of them, are able to project for themselves in their own minds pockets of time. How do you become better? How do you become a better version of yourself? You know, we already are who we are. We don't meet that many people on the streets. It's like, you know what? I want to be a much worse person tomorrow. <laughs> you know, it's like, we want to become better versions of wherever we are. So hopefully they will paint pictures of that for themselves. Oh, I could, you know, in this area, I could do this a little bit differently, or I don't want to do that anymore at all. You know, whatever that picture is, that is a better version of, of themselves. Hopefully the, the peace will be there, you know. So for me, the idea of doorways as we experience them, and when I say we, I'm thinking about artists right now, just in general. We kind of talked about how they, how we reflect the times we live in. And if we're thinking about doorways as moments in time that happen, the great Nina Simone said, it is, a, it is your duty, it is our duty as artists to reflect the times that we live in. So I feel that sense of responsibility from moment to moment. There's something again about just being rushed from moment to moment that I think does not help us to be better human beings. Henry David Thoreau said, I will not be hurried by a false race and I will not be shipwrecked by a vain reality. In regards to doorways, if I can just sit and, and understand this moment of what has happened to me and how I need to respond and just be better at that and hopefully inspire someone else to be better at it too, <laughs> then the next room is going to be hopefully a better scenario or situation. I hope I hope I can communicate that.